Assalamualaikum and good day to everybody. I am Muhammad Ifaiman bin Razali and we will be presenting the topic Sociocultural Factors of Adolescence. Subtopics will include culture, stereotypes or generalizations, attitude, second culture acquisition, social distance, language, policy and politics, language, talk and culture, and culture in language class. Culture. Culture refers to the cumulative deposit of knowledge, experience, beliefs, values, attitudes, meanings, hierarchies, religion, notions of time, roles, special relations, concepts of the universe, and material objects and possessions acquired by a group of people in the course of generations through individual and group striving. When talking about culture, Culture in its broadest sense is cultivated behavior, that is, the totality of a person's learned, accumulated experience, which is socially transmitted, or more briefly, behavior through social learning. Culture is the sum of total of the learned behavior of a group of people that are generally considered to be the tradition of that people and are transmitted from generation to generation. Stereotypes and Generalization When talking about stereotypes and generalization, we often get confused about both of these because both involves making broad statements of a group of people. When we generalize, we examine the behavior and look for parallels. While doing so, we try to be descriptive rather than judgmental. Stereotypes Tend to stereotypes tend to categorize people into groups with the intention of restricting that group. Rather than describing, stereotypes seek to make judgments. To make it simple, generalizations are helpful because they because they are used consciously and analytically, are descriptive and flexible. Seek to be accurate, are an attempt to capture similarities and principles are and are constantly modified by new input. Stereotypes are harmful because they are used unconsciously and reactively, are judgmental and rigid, seek to be simple, are an attempt to limit and pigeonhole are fixed and not open to revisiting. Assalamualaikum and hi everyone. I will continue in attitude parts. So, what is attitude? The word attitude can be used to express the way someone behaves as a result of how they think or they see. In other words, attitude is coming from stereotype, which means the way we think determines our behavior. So, how do attitude can influence social culture factors in the learning process among adolescents? This is because social cultural theory focuses not only on how adolescents and peers learning, but also on how cultural beliefs and attitudes affect how learning takes place. The negative attitude among adolescents usually is influenced by insufficient knowledge, misinformed, stereotyping and extreme ethnocentric thinking so teachers should be a good role model to the adolescent by showing a positive attitude and always giving an advice and guidance to them therefore the positive attitude can help the learning process among adolescents next is second culture acquisition Second culture acquisition happens by learning a second language involves a second culture. By learning this, they are to effect by have a second culture acquisition. First is acculturation. Acculturation is a process of becoming adapted to a new culture when exposed to a new culture, either through communication or behavior and so on. Secondly is culture shock. When adolescents are exposed and adapted to a new culture, 
There are four stages of culture shock that the adolescent will face. First is excitement and euphoria of the new culture. Thirdly is acceptance of differences in thinking and feeling around them. And lastly is assimilation and adaptation. So that's all from me. I will give the presentation to the next presenter. Thank you. Thank you to the previous uh, presenter. My name is Muhammad Amir Ilham bin Hasmiza and I will continue with my part of the presentation which is social distance. So what exactly is social distance, you may ask? Social distance is the cognitive and affective closeness proximity of two cultures that come into contact within an individual. It is the degree of acceptance or rejection of social interaction between individuals and especially those belonging to different social groups such as those based on race, ethnicity, class, or gender. Social distance is not a static cognitive attribute of acceptance. People can shift and change their sense of affinity or dissonance with particular groups across different contexts. For example, an Indonesian who studies the USA will deal with two cultures, former Indonesian culture and new American culture. She or he will be easy to learn English as the target language there because English is the dominant language in the USA. According to John Schumann, social distance contains the following parameters, which are dominance, integration, congruence, and permanence. Dominance is the idea that the target language is dominant and superior to the other. Integration is the degree of socialization with the target culture. Congruence refers to the similarity between the two cultures, and the idea is that if they are similar, the learning will be easier. Permanence refer to the period that a learner could stay in the target culture. The longer he could stay, the easier he could learn the new language. The greater the social distance between two cultures, the greater the difficulty to learn its language and conversely, the smaller the social distance, the better will be the learning situation. So how exactly do we measure social distance? The first way is simply through direct observation of people interacting. Direct observation is when you watch interactions, processes or behaviors as they occur. The second one is called PDAQ or Perceived Difficulty Assessment Questionnaire. The PDAQ is a simple self-measures of difficulty that can be included in every assignment completed uh, by a student. For example, exams, quizzes, homework assignments, field trip reports, and etc. The PDAQ uses a 5-point liquid scale to assess perceived difficulty and perceived length of the exercise among other items and incorporates a short open-ended questions that request the student's opinion and or comments on the exercise. Similar to the PDAQ, the third way is Bordager's social distance scale. Emory S. Bogardus created the Bogardus social distance scale to measure people's willingness to participate in a varying level of closeness with other social, racial, and ethnic groups. It is a form of psychological testing skill. The last three are through lack of objectivity, optimal distance model at stage 3 of uh, culture acquisition, and through the differences in second culture acquisitions in adults and children. That is all from me. I would pass to the next person. Thank you. Assalamualaikum and hello. My name is Nufatha Binti Amir Mani and today I'm going to explain about Profane Brenner's Ecological Theory. Profane Brenner's Ecological Theory developed by Yuri Profane Brenner's at 1917. This theory presents the child development within the context of relationship system that comprise the child environment. 
Brown van Bernard suggested that the environment of the child is a nested arrangement of structures, each contained within the next. He organized them in order on how much of an impact they have on a child. He named the structure the microsystem, mesosystem, exosystem, macrosystem, and the chronosystem. The microsystem is the first level of birth and brainer's theory and are the things that have direct contact with the child in the immediate environment, such as parents, siblings, teachers, and school peers. Relationships in the microsystem are bidirectional, meaning the child can be influenced by other people in their environment and is also capable of changing their belief and actions of other people too. Furthermore, the relation of the child to individuals in their microsystem can influence how they treat them in return. The interaction with the microsystem are often very personal and crucial for fostering and supporting the child's development. If a child has a strong nurturing relationship uh, with their parents, this is said to have a positive effect on the child. Whereas distant and unaffectionate parents will have a negative effect uh, on their child. The mesosystem encompasses the interaction between the child's microsystem, such as the interaction between the child, parents, and teachers, or between the school peer of siblings. The mesosystem is where a person's individual microsystem do not function independently, but are interconnected and assert influence upon one another. For instance, if a child's parents communicate with the child teacher, this interaction may influence the child development. Essentially, a mesosystem is a system of microsystem. According to the ecological system theory, if the child parents and teachers uh, get along and have a good relationship, this should have positive effect on the child development compared to negative effect on development if the teachers and parents do not get along. The exosystem is a component of the ecological system theory developed by Yuri Brofenbrenes in the 1970s. It incorporates other formal and informal social structures which do not themselves contain the child but indirectly influence them as they affect one of the microsystem. Examples of exosystem include the neighborhood, parents' workplace, parents' friends, and the mass media. These are environments in which the child is not involved and are external to their experience but nonetheless affect them anyway. An instant exosystem affecting the child's development could be if one of the parents had a dispute with their boss at their workplace. The parent may come home and have a short temper with the child as a result of something which happened in their workplace, resulting in a negative effect of the child's development. The macro system is the theory that focuses on how cultural elements affect a child development, such as socio-economy status, wealth, poverty, and ethnicity. Thus, culture that individuals are immersed within any influence their belief and perceptions about events that transpire in life. The macro system differs from the previous ecosystem as it does not refer to the specific environment of one developing child. The macrosystem differs from the previous ecosystem as it does not refer to the specific environment of one developing child, but the already established society and culture which the child is developing in. For example, a child that living in the third world country would have experienced a different development than the child that living in the wealthier country. The fifth and final level of the Brofen Brenner's ecological system theory is known as chrono system. This system consists of all the environment changes that occurs during the lifetime which influence development, including major life transition or historical events. This can include normal life transitions such as starting school, but it can also include non-normative life transitions such as parents getting divorced or moving to the new house. Good day everybody. My name is Andre Daniel and I would like to present about language, policy and politics. I just want to make it short and simple to understand. I would like to explain to you about um, English. English is a lingua franca which which become an international language to whole nation, 
including our country. And now, I would like to explain to you about three types of English that you need to know. ENL, ESL, and EFL. ENL, which is English Native Language, which um, a certain nations just like uh, United Kingdom, USA, and Canada, which they use English as their first language. English ESL or English as a second language, just like our country, Malaysia, who use uh, English as a second language as an official language. And EFL, foreign language, which be used by certain countries who seldomly or not spoken natively English language. And now, I would like to explain to you about linguistic imperialism and language rights. Linguistic imperialism give a lot of things that being concept of imperialism, which they're creating cultural inequalities between English and non-English, or there is a terms of genocides against non-English, as we know about the colonizers. And the second one is about propagations of English by the concept of imperialism in the world politically economically and socially which is also be affected nowadays and i would like to explain about language rights which lang english language promoting as an agent of unity just just what we see nowadays and also promoting by law for native language development as we as we saw what happened to the united nations which they also want to protect the human rights and some else now, I would like to explain to you about teaching implication. Should any institution refrain from teaching English to preserve language and culture? Perhaps yes, perhaps no. It depends on the certain country's custom. But for my opinion that you cannot refrain English just like that. But you need to have some, you need to have some balance between your native language and literally international language for example like english so that's why our country are uh, having a policy which is upholding the malay language and strengthening the english language policy which we call as mbm and mbi which in malaysia literally they use um, malaysia language and english language in our education system as we know that so to perhaps in, especially in mathematics and science to make sure that we can understand both of them just like throwing two birds with one stone so i think that's all from me thank you good morning everyone especially to dr sama for my part i'll be explaining about how does language affect students development from your point of view how does language affect students development let's take a look at the wolfian hypothesis the term Wolfian hypothesis takes its name from Benjamin Lee Wolf who claimed that the language one speaks influences one's thinking. Wolf was an amateur linguist who studied with the anthropologist Edward Safi in the 1920s and 1930s. The term safi wolf hypothesis is also used to refer to their view that language determines thinking. Linguistic determinism and linguistic relativity are also terms referring to the notion that the characteristics of one's language shape one's cognition. So basically, it suggests that human thought is influenced by the language one speaks. Does language reflect culture? People speak roughly 7,000 languages worldwide. Although there is a lot in common among languages, each one is unique, both in its structure and in the way it reflects the culture of the people who speak it. Different anthropologists define language differently. However, all the different definitions include the beliefs of the people, the expectations, their shared values, their customs, and related rituals, the jargon that is unique to the society, and most importantly, their language. Culture and language share mutual interdependence. In other words, if we want to attain a good command of any given language, we have to know the cultural beliefs and structures of the people speaking that language. One of the biggest problems that students and instructors face is the breakdown in communication due to grammatical error. For, the, for an example, a student wrote a terrific essay but it was filled with a lot of grammatical errors. For instance, great was used instead of great and invention was used instead of invention. Such errors are usually as a result of the influence of the first language of the student which inevitably influence his thinking and subsequent constructions of sentences in the second language. Moving to the next question, does language shape culture? 
Speaking, writing, and reading are integral to everyday life, where language is the primary tool for expression and communication. Studying how people use language, what words and phrases they unconsciously choose and combine, can help us better understand ourselves and why we behave the way we do. One study showed that a relatively harmless sentence such as girls are as good as boys at math can subtly perpetuate sexist stereotype. Because of the statement's grammatical structure, it implies that being good at math is more common or natural for boys than girls. So the main question is, how does this affect students' development? Language barriers in the classroom leave students behind from the start. Despite years of schooling, many language minority students end up essentially illiterate. This is such a huge problem because these kids are not getting the same opportunities to meet their full potential. The four options are creating equal education for all students, motivating kids through support system both inside and outside of the classroom, doing away with standardized tests, and lastly by using various forms of non-verbal communication amongst diverse students. Language mastery helps students to analyze ideas more efficiently, develop critical thinking, problem solving, and decision making skills. Through language, students can meet their full potential. Thank you. Have a sweet day and morning to our lecturer. As you know, I am Kalai, going to bring you two subtopics, which is culture in language classroom or just classroom, and a conclusion for our entire group as well. You excited? So do I. If you guys wanted to know, I'm going to start with a quote by Brown who said the language is a part of culture and culture is a part of language. Both are intricately interwoven so that one cannot separate them without losing the significance of either language or culture. So now, it means that culture works in classroom using medium that we call as language and it depends each other. It needed to create ideas skills, art, and tools by teacher and students as we see in definition of culture. Let's move into the importance of culture in classroom. First, learners achieve positive results during cross-culture situation. Second, culture helps everyone to understand to not everyone is like me. Flip the coin, effective culture in classroom helps to aid dispelling false myths and values. Lastly, it's a great potential to lead a new generation with culture. It's all like what and why culture is needed in classroom. It's quite different from the other subtopics because in this case, it's kind of focused to one particular space, which we call it as classroom. Guys, how culture can help to prevent negative impact from cross-cultural situation? Let's see. To tell you guys, students and teachers have different background history where it all leads to those all by different by religion, tradition and beliefs and language as well. Even though language is different, language gonna unite all under one roof, English. Like our lecturer from outside Malaysia still connected with us using English language. Culture will prevent misconceptions among students that lead to division as well. For example, in Malaysia, India, Chinese and Malays still under UPSI, learning what we want with a safe environment. This we call as culture. We cannot see it, but there is. We need to feel it. Dear fellow friends, culture will lead to us understand that not everyone is like me, where teachers will write their side to see students are very unique. Language as bridge to connect them to spread the safe culture. You know, you know why? That's why we are all here still connected with our lecturer from outside Malaysia indirectly helped us to not bias lecturer dislikes or likes anyone personally. Here we can see the unity in our culture classroom. See, wherever is culture, language is there to keep the culture is going to spread correctly and keep growing as well. Believe me, culture in classroom bring to dispel false myths and values. You know why? Let me tell you guys. The way to produce culture, teacher need to strength value of culture itself first. It's an action to dispel false myths among students in classroom, where it will bring to a culture. 
For an example, problems faced by Malaysians right now raises prevented and teachers can spread positivity among students where humanity as the highest human value. Move to right as you can see culture in classroom as a potential to produce new generation. Teachers can protect students from hazards outside to form a circle of students with culture. In this case, it means classroom. If you don't believe, this small circle will lead to a cultural generation in future that we call it as societal cultural circle. Don't rush, even this video going to end, but there is a conclusion for you. As we seen on, culture in classroom is about how culture can benefit students, how teachers can produce cultural student community, and how it all comes to successful learning event during a class. As we all know, one of the biggest challenge for students in Malaysia, probably cultural shock and social distance can overcome by gather all three races, Malay, Indian and Chinese students along with some international students to form them as some Malaysian. So guys, culture is around us. It's not a subject go and learn, but it's about a quality of value to feel and spread. That's why culture known as a way of life. It's a context between, sorry, with which we exist. Think, feel and relate to each other. See, we need to think rationally, feel it by heart and relate and share with others as well.